All right, welcome to our special Easter Tech Setup Q&A live stream. We're very excited to be helping you guys with any questions you might have regarding Easter live streaming tech setups for your houses of worship. So we want to do a special live stream just for that. Um, I'm watching on the chat here on YouTube. If you're excited about live streaming your Easter service, hit that like button. If you're a little worried, hit the down button because either way, we're going to help you. I thought it'd be kind of cool to do a little YouTube poll there. Um, but I have a couple guests with me. We have 10 tips we're going to go over for live streaming worship services this Easter season. And then we're going to flip it over to you guys. We've got an open Zoom room that Tess is moderating. So you guys can come in and ask questions. And of course, Q&A via the live stream. So let me introduce Tess and Stephen, my co-hosts, who are going to be discussing some of these great tips for Easter services. Hi, guys. Hey, hey Paul. Paul. Thanks for having us. Hey, Paul. Hey, Tess. Hey, guys. Mike has the YouTube analytics up, and so we're not seeing Tess. He's going to, uh, the, the screen you're capture that we're doing up, to huh? capture Tess. You're covering Tess up, Stephen, or Michael. <laughs> How could That's you do okay. That to me? He's going to bring you up, and we're going to go over our first tip. So you just got to open Zoom up, essentially, on the screen, and then she'll be up. Okay. It's not capturing it. Okay. All right. All right. This is what live streaming is all about. So we're going to start right off with this. Um, essentially, uh, you need to go to the desktop capture, uh, which is right at the top here, and go ahead and scroll down to that. Up, up one more. Right there, and right-click it and hit two. Signed in four. There we go. Am I here? No problem. All right. So, tip number one: always, always have someone on technical on on hand. Tess is here. How are you doing, Tess? I'm doing great. It's Friday, and I'm ready for this Easter special. How are you doing, Stephen? Well, I'm I'm doing well. For once, I don't have to do it. I can just sit here and watch you guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do the technical work. <laughs> well, we've got 10 quick tips, and then we're going to open it up to the Zoom session. Anyone can ask any questions. It's really about the Q&A. But tip number one, Stephen, tell me how you feel about this one. Engaging and training your volunteers. Uh, 100%. I think this, is, this should be the first and foremost thing uh, a church should look into doing is, is training your volunteers and make it in a way, Paul, that is easy and, and fun to do so that, um, especially if you have a multitude of people, each person's in charge of a certain area. So it makes it very seamless in training them. The other part to that I have here is document your plan. Um, and one thing I've heard from so many churches who have read the Helping Your Church live stream book is to just you know, share the book with a volunteer so they kind of understand the vocabulary of, of what they're doing and share the documentation, share the live streaming setup so that everyone kind of understands, you know, as you're trying to recruit new volunteers and get the buy-in from them, A, make it fun, like you said, but share the plan so everyone's kind of on board. Absolutely. All right. Tip number two, be interactive. And I'm a huge fan of hosting a zoom meeting even while you're live streaming what do you guys think about that definitely we're uh, getting great comments in zoom even right now bob is suggesting document all aspects of your process so it's a great way to add interactivity to your uh, service i think even like what we're doing here with the show i think it's it's something that a congregation even after the said pandemic is over you can incorporate this into a, a, as you said, Paul, earlier when we were discussing this, a, a hybrid model of a church service where you can have Zoom or, you know, whatever your favorite platform is and be able to have the, the pastor, you know, interact with an online congregation as well as a uh, congregation in-house and, and get that from, and, and not just in your area, you could have people joining from other countries. So it's really a great option. Well, and some of you might be wondering, what is this QR code down here? Something we'll talk about, but that is actually a guide to hosting hybrid streaming services. 
Um, so hosting, uh, we actually worked with John Roberts from Trinity United Church. He optimized his OBS setup to also work with Zoom. So they're able to live stream and run a Zoom meeting at the same time. So if you just pop your phone out and scan that little QR code, that will actually get you that download of our guide for hosting hybrid services, which I think, Stephen and Tess, you know, I think moving forward, there's going to be some level of a hybrid online service, whereas many, many places might have in person was the only option. I think in the future, you know, having interactive and online op options is going to be kind of the only way forward. I think so. Uh, you know, I, my, my thing with that is, is, um, is, is there enough knowledge out there to understand what a QR code is? And that's why you want to kind of watch shows like this. I mean, Tess, from your, from your experience, you know, when, when you look at something like this, is it easy or is it something like in, in a church format that you'd be like, uh, explain to me what that is. I feel like I I'm part of a generation that would be familiar with that type of, um, technology, but it would certainly be something that you'd need to educate, um, a lot of different congregations about. So it's a fun idea and I think it can totally work, especially for that younger generation, but it's all about educating your congregation. Paul's next book, Learning QR <laughs> Codes. <laughs> next, next tip. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about QR codes and I think they're good. Um, but here's one Stephen you know, said they use a lot at, at, at his church as well is the short videos. And I, I think it, it goes to show, you know, some thought process. It does take a little upfront work, but tell us some of the ways you've been using kind of short videos in the worship services that you guys are doing over there. Well, we use a lot as far as like in our um, announcements and things like that. Uh, we'll have different uh, announcements pertaining to a season or, you know, whatever's coming up. But it, it's a fun way to kind of break up the announcements. But sometimes the senior pastors will use them or, we'll, you know, I'll use them in a message. Just kind of break up the monotony of just somebody standing there talking to them, kind of like what we do here with video production. We don't just constantly have static cameras. We have different graphics, as you're seeing now. So I think really it, it really adds to your your church production. I think so, too. And it, it really helps you to, to tell your story. So if, if mm -hmm. there's something happening, you know, you can get uh, anyone in your congregation to submit videos. Um, you can have contests. You can have, you know, contributions from the staff, from, uh, you know, kids, all kinds of things, uh, uh, as long as it's appropriate. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot you can do with that. Absolutely. Let's go to tip number four, Mike. Um, tip number four is... This is an interesting one. I've been seeing a lot more, hearing a lot about this, this modern family style of worship services where you throw the Zoom meeting up and you're actually allowing other people to contribute. Um, give the pastor a break. You know, obviously he, he's, he's doing a lot of work every week and probably will kick things off. But consider maybe giving other folks in the congregation who maybe you're still at home, maybe you're, you know, joining remotely the ability to jump on screen and, and contribute. What my, my good friend who spoke at the last um, worship summit, he actually incorporated this into their night of worship that they do Wednesday nights where he had um, a, a girl that used to go to their, their church, but I think she went to college up in uh, Maine or something. Well, he had her get on VMX call and she actually did a song during their worship uh, service that they were doing um, where he was able to interact with her and, and have her start it and maybe even play along with her. And then he went back to normal. So I definitely see that there's a lot of potential with this. Yeah, the way you mentioned it too, Stephen, it's almost like bringing guests onto your show. Um, right. And I think that's something that might be a little foreign and it's a little technical. Um, but as you said, if you're using vMix, there's something called vMix Call that makes it really easy. If you're using Zoom, we have some videos and tutorials on how to connect like OBS and Zoom and vMix and Zoom. We're doing it now and I'm happy to explain exactly how we do it. Um, but that opportunity to just, and, and I have an in-ear monitor and Stephen has an in-ear monitor. So if you're a pastor and you've got a microphone and in-ear monitor, you should be able to hear anyone in Zoom. And we're going to demonstrate that today. But then you have the option to just open it up 
and just, you know, maybe you want to plan that out. Maybe you want to say, all right, well, you know, X person is going to speak next and kind of spread out the love a little bit. I can see that with like prayer requests or even having like a clergy member, something read Bible verses. Now, Zoom moderation is going to be important. And I think that's our next tip, Mike. I'm not sure if that's tip number five, but if you're going to be opening it up to the world and having guests on your show, either plan it out or have a good Zoom moderator. Oh, QR codes is next. Well, this one's quick. I think there's a lot of opportunity for QR codes if people understand how to use them. For example, to request uh, contributions and donations to specific causes, it's really easy to just scan that QR code. I, I know I'm hearing, and I've been hearing this for years, that uh, people are much, you know, really starting to donate online, donate with their phones instead of, you know, actually giving cash. Um, so, you know, the world's changing in that direction. And once you get that across, that you can just scan the code. Uh, I think it, it just skips a step of actually having to manually type in um, a, a link, right? Oh, absolutely. We we do online giving. We have a PayPal uh, quick button uh, set up for like donations and whatnot. Um, I've I've even seen people at different trade shows. They give out business cards that just have a QR code on it that you know you get at home or and you scan it, and that's their business card. So. I mean, I'm all for it. I just think there's there's got to be some education around it for you know certain congregations. So it's a good thing. Yeah, it's something to try. Give it g give it a try, and we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, our next one I think is about Zoom moderation. So I'll let Tess take this one. Oh, okay. This is hosting spiritual sharing sessions in Zoom breakout rooms. Tess, do you want to kind of explain the the breakout room functionality of Zoom? Sure. So Zoom does allow um, what we're calling breakout rooms. They're separate individual meeting rooms that a uh, Zoom host can create. They can have different topics. And anybody that's in that Zoom meeting, you can uh, segment them into each of those breakout rooms. So um, whether you want to have a woman's Bible study breakout room or I don't know, Maybe, Stephen, since you're so involved in your um, house of worship, you could come up with some better ideas of what a possible breakout room option might be for houses of worship. Um, or or I'm trying to think some sort of uh, prayer room and the like. But yeah, Zoom has that functionality for conferencing, and it's a creative way to take advantage of a Zoom feature for um, your worship service. Well, I mean, it's, it's, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's great for if you had to do counseling, marital counseling, if you had to do uh, meet with somebody for uh, a death in the, in the family and you needed to get that information as a, as a pastor for uh, the funeral service or, you know, just family counseling, anything, anything that you want private that you want to keep it, uh, it, it gives you that functionality. So I think you're right on it. It's, it's very important. A new uh, feature in Zoom breakout rooms I wanted to mention. Uh, so you have everyone in the main room, and then there's these this little square that says breakout rooms. And again, probably need some education if it's the first time people are using them. Uh, it's kind of like the annex, right, or the coffee the coffee break after the service where you get to have smaller groups. So a lot of times when you have 50, 100 people in a Zoom meeting, not everybody gets to talk. But when you break 50 people up into 10 groups of five, a lot more people can listen and a lot more people can get to know each other faster. So it's a great use of everyone's time. And now Zoom allows you to have self-selectable Zoom breakout rooms. So before the Zoom meeting even starts, you can predefine four or five breakout rooms. The kids' breakout room, the women's breakout room, the men's breakout room, the, you know, all these different breakout rooms, and they're self-selectable. So you could have the family room. And so if, you know, if there's a family of five, but they're all logged into one Zoom account, Maybe they'll go into the, the young families uh, breakout room. So it's a great way to, sorry, to give people the opportunity to kind of, you know, flock together in smaller, more meaningful groups and uh, do spiritual sharing. Uh, there's so much you can do there. Um, so highly, highly recommend the use of breakout rooms. Kind of like small Facebook groups, says Focus Video. Bless you. Thank you. All right, <laughs> tip number seven. Boom. Who is the Zoom moderator? Tess, you're our Zoom moderator today. What are some of the things that you do to make sure 
that five people aren't talking at the same time and you know the right guests come on at the right time well it's all about having somebody dedicated to that role the zoom host if you have that assignment can mute people can admit people if you have a waiting room and they can also decline people if there's some sort of inappropriate account that's joined um that's joined your meeting so that's really important to have for the security of your congregation um and it's also great to have a co-host, which I have today, which is also backup. Since I'm participating in the meeting as well, it's nice to have a host and a co-host, which is a you know cool little Zoom feature, to have that backup to mute people when needed or unmute people and the like. Mike, while you're on this shot, which I think is great with Tess with the eggs around her, can you hover over the Zoom account, the Zoom uh, interface with your with your mouse? Oh, okay. So you can't see. I was okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. I was just gonna say we could show those Zoom meeting. Uh, there's a security button um, now on the, all the Zoom meetings, and a couple of the things that Zoom moderators use is you can lock the meeting. Now a lot of folks don't feel like they need to do that, but if you have everybody in there, you can lock it so that no unwanted Zoom bombers can join. Uh, you can also mute everyone. So, you know, if you're kicking it off, you want to have people be able to speak, but you just want to mute all at the beginning of a service so you're not getting a bunch of uh, people talking at the same time. That way you can recommend that people use the raise hand feature so you can unmute them one at a time, which makes the, you know, your pastor's life a lot easier when he's trying to answer questions with a, with a large group. All right. Tip number eight. This is one that Stephen does for his, for his church. Um, who is managing the website? And it's important because, you know, who's going to embed the, the live stream into the website? Who's going to have the, the button for joining Zoom uh, on there? Uh, has that been uh, a pain for you, Stephen, to have to manage the website every week? Uh, it, it has. And, and I haven't found somebody yet that really wants to take it on. And, and the bad part about it is I started this because of my own stuff, right? Um, and I just do it with WordPress like most people. Um, but when it goes down, it's like two, three in the morning, you got to get it back up, you know, or you're getting a call and it is, it's, it's something that, uh, I don't wish on any media director, honestly, you got to be able to separate that because it does take time. But I am in the process of, of trying to train one of the youth to handle it since they are very, you know, into the technology, the blogging and, and, and WordPress. And since it, the foundation is already there understanding how it works i think it's definitely something that um we should uh you know embark on the training because i just don't have time for it anymore i i really don't i i do what i got to do to keep it up but i think you need to find paul uh somebody that's dedicated that either has the drive to do it or has the know-how to do it or train them um it's not something i <laughs> i think you, you should take on yourself with everything else personally no, I understand. And if you're using WordPress, um, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of plugins you can you, you can add for security and you really have to because for whatever reason, they go down more than you'd yes. like. By the way, I asked everybody at the beginning of the stream to hit the like button if they're excited to live stream their worship services on Easter weekend and the down button if you're worried. And right now we've got 10 people with the up and nobody with the down. So I don't, it doesn't seem like anyone's too worried about live streaming um, the Easter worship services. Maybe these tips are, are really helping out, but feel free to vote on YouTube by just hitting the, the up, down, or the, or the down. All right, we've got two more left and we're going to open it up to Q&A. So here's one for you, Stephen. This is just a high level one. How do we make life easy? What are some simple tips that we can share that just, you know, one that I would share is like, what is the backup plan? Um, you know, for me, a lot of times, like the backup plan might be just, all right, let's back up. If, if the live stream goes down, at least we have Zoom, right? Maybe that's a level of a backup plan. So having a backup plan, I feel like makes you more confident because you're just like, look, if, if something happens for me, I lose my cool. I'm like, oh my gosh, the stream is down. I start freaking out and I get scared. But if you've got the backup plan, then you know exactly what to do. And you're just like, all right, we're on backup plan mode now. We're going on plan B. Well, I, I think for, for us, 
our backup plan is um, we use a TriCaster, but we also use a, a Wirecast machine. And so we can stream from either one. So if one goes down, we have the ability to stream out from the other one, even if it's a single camera. And I think that, don't be so focused on having multiple cameras. You just need to get that service off. So I would, I would highly suggest having a camera accessible, especially with NDI and IP technology, you have that ability to get that into another system like Wirecast or vMix or whatever you're using, OBS. Have a second computer that you can at least stream out one camera, at least get that feed out. The other thing I would say, uh, to make your life easier, don't look at this as this is job security. I can go around and I'm in charge. And my thing is I'm always training my replacement. That's my mentality going into different pieces of ministry. And the reason for that is I kind of, as, as I train people, I'm freed up then to do other things within the ministry. And as, you know, as I work as an assistant pastor, I'm also the media director, but I've trained up one of the youth kids that I had when I was a youth pastor to do everything that I do, unless he gets into super technical issues, he's now training up the youth kids. So my mentality and my leadership within the church is I'm always teaching people to train your replacement. And I think that's going to make your life easy because you can go in there on a Sunday or you can go in there on a Wednesday or whatever you're doing and, and have the expectation that you're not going to be needed. And, and there are times I go in there and I'm not needed, Paul, for anything because they've got it all under control. And then I feel like I've successfully done my job because you don't want one guy just knowing everything. Because when catastrophe strikes, you need it's easier to get a group of guys going, okay, I understand how this works, and put 10 heads together rather than just that one guy. So that's that's kind of my tip, if you will, for making life easier. That is such a good perspective because it, it should – pay dividends in the long term. So I'd love to hear, I'd love to open that one up to the audience as well, because we have just one more tip and we're going to start answering questions from the Q&A. We'll open up the Zoom. But here's one that uh, we've talked about in the past and I've heard some really success stories. In fact, um, the, Presby the United Presbyterian Church, one block away from here, they live stream every Sunday and they were doing this long ago. But their live stream is actually played at the local senior living center. So while their live stream numbers, you know, don't account for the fact that there's, at the time, there was like 100 people sitting in an auditorium, you know, with one YouTube account showing it. Um, but that's just an awesome opportunity to extend your church's um, live stream and the message. You know, a lot of uh, seniors who are in these living centers feel a little bit disconnected right now. Um, we really need to take care of them and make sure that we're staying socially distant. And, you know, I really think that it's something that we should all be thinking about. Is, does the local senior living center have access to the live streams? Do they know um, that they can use an iPhone or an iPad on a Sunday? And then do they, and I don't know how far you can take this, but we do have a guide um, at the QR code below on some ideas on how to connect with the local senior living center if you want to scan the QR code. But uh, there's a lot of different ways. And uh, you know, one was asking them to share it in, on a projector because a lot of senior living centers have an auditorium. That might not be the safest way today. Now the next way might be saying, well, can, should we donate some iPads? Do we, should we ask if they have a good enough Wi-Fi? Um, but making a goodwill gesture to a local senior living center and saying, hey, we want to help make this happen because uh, a lot of the seniors in these living centers were once members of your church. And so we yeah. want to make sure they're not forgotten and we want to make sure that they get the access. Well, Paul, right? if I can add to that real quick, uh, one of the things that we do to make it a little easier, we've created a Roku app that mm. um, most of the TVs now, you can go to your local Walmart and buy you know, a 43-inch television for a little bit under $200. And so having that Roku app makes it just like running TV, which is everybody's used to. So keeping the expense lower now creating the app a lot of these cdns uh, for churches do create it with their monthly package you can find independent developers on fiverr that will create the app for you it, it can be pricey if you go that route but there's all these options now um with fire tv roku apple tv now that paul is a viable option for folks um that are really getting into the media to get it into these uh, these assisted living centers. 
that is such a good um that's such a good option look at you mike throwing together uh video production this. video production city right here well uh this is so festive i don't even mike gets a little uh clap for you good job mike Mike's really, really getting excited for Easter. So let's open it up for Q and A. We'll test. We're gonna put. You, we're gonna kind of put you in charge here of our our Q and A moderator. Um, Stephen and I are here to answer any questions. Um, but let's open it up. Maybe we'll put Zoom in grid view, um, and we'll we'll see what everybody thinks. We can start off with a tip from our audience, Gary Puritan, Purintin, pardon if I messed that up, says post an activity page with your presentation, like a fill in the blank notes page or a crossword puzzle with clues from the presentation. That's a classic, I like that one. I like that a lot. Um, Timothy on YouTube is asking, if you are using a switcher streaming multiple cameras, it's no different from streaming one camera. So I guess we're that's looking back at if uh, we lost the stream. Oh yeah. Yeah. So l let me kind of go with that. Sometimes certain hardware switchers can go down. I've had that happen before due to a hardware failure on it. So um, a lot of what I do, even in my studio here, I have a hardware switcher, but I also have an SDI router where I'll route. The video signals to both the TriCaster and to the Wirecast slash VMix box, whatever you know, whatever I'm using at that particular time. So let's say if the TriCaster went down for whatever reason, I then have all those video inputs readily available to me in a Wirecast or VMix situation. So that's kind of what I meant by that. So some some folks might be using, you know, Blackmagic ATEM switcher or, or whatever. Um, you got to plan for the worst, but hope for the best. I mean, that's kind of my mentality going into any video production. I always have a backup, and sometimes, me personally, and I'm sure, Paul, you're the same way, is sometimes things are overkill, whether it's a backup recording, whether it's, you know, a switcher. I always have at least another machine that I can just quickly switch on and, and, and be ready to go where I have it running already. So, you know, that I guess that's where I meant um, with that backup plan. Yeah, well, that's, that makes Nook sense. Nook is asking, sorry, were you going to comment ahead. on that? No, Paul? go ahead. Nook is asking us, what tasks can a non-technical volunteer take on in a live streaming process? Is that a good start, first starting step? Well, I think Tess, you could probably answer that one with the whole moderator um, scenario. Yes, yeah. being given access to the stream or the Zoom moderation, let somebody set it up for you and just communicate. Um, as long as you know typing, you should be good to go. And, and also, possibly, if you have like a joystick, maybe camera operation with just some simple presets, that might be something if you just have one thing to focus on and it's the joystick, that, that could possibly be something to start with. Well, and I like that answer of Zoom moderation because understanding how to use the tool Zoom is not something just something that you can use on Sunday, but I think most people are using it in business, in, in their work. It's becoming a full, you know, uh, the way of, of communication right now. So understanding the way that those, those Zoom tools work really translates to, you know, your career very quickly and easily. So uh, you could probably identify somebody in your congregation who's really good at zoom and that you could definitely get volunteers because it's it's technical enough that that you know they're considered on the media team but it, it really crosses borders and boundaries i think than just looking for like a live streaming broadcast engineer and i'm glad tess said about camera camera operator because that's honestly how we start our volunteers out is running the camera they have to understand framing uh starting with the basics you know how to how to make a good shot because you can't switch a shot as michael tell you if something's not framed right you don't want to dump to that camera you don't want to go to that camera because you know maybe maybe the you know you're cutting off somebody's head and and so i always start folks at the beginning i start them with understanding the cam the camera and how it works and setting that up and um you know running it with you know with the joystick or, or within the software and then we kind of move them uh, before that 
even before running the camera, we have them run what's called Pro Presenter, and that's our slides, just keeping track and making sure they're paying attention. Then they go to the cameras, and then from there, they get trained on the video switching aspect. After they get to the point, and I see like, wow, they're really you know, tearing it up with the switching, then I start getting into setup and helping them understand like, this is for switching. We then send it to an encoding machine, which then distributes it to the overflow TVs, and they get a better understanding of how the technology works within your setup. And audio, that's a completely separate animal, but if they're just doing video, that's kind of our progress. That's kind of our progression of how we do it at, at when we're training people. We don't just throw somebody right on uh, vMix or the TriCaster. We, we set them up and, and make them learn from the basics. Don is asking how we are doing this with Zoom right now with three different locations and three Zoom feeds. Let me see if I can find Don's comment. Is that on YouTube? It's on Zoom. Oh, it's on Zoom. Well, and that actually also answers a question from Rob Martin, who's saying, where do I find a guide or instructions on how to use the PTZ optics camera through OBS and have it be part of a Zoom meeting? So let's take a moment to talk about this because it is really cool. And I will say that our Stream Geeks YouTube channel, Tess, I don't know if you could pop that into the chat. That's where we put all of the tutorials that aren't directly related to PTZ Optics cameras. Uh, so connecting vMix to Zoom, connecting OBS to Zoom, that is where we put those videos on the Stream Geeks channel. So we'll pop that into the chat and you guys can go over there and check out those videos. But I'm going to briefly explain it, and uh, I will answer any questions necessary. For controlling a PTZ camera in OBS, we have a plugin for PTZ Optics cameras in OBS that allows you to control the cameras in OBS. So you just put the camera on your network, your OBS computer is on the network, type the IP address in, and you can control your camera without even having to leave the OBS screen, which is pretty nice. Now, if you want to connect OBS to Zoom, I think it's one of the best things you can do to make your live streams more interactive and your Zoom sessions more interactive. We've got some great videos on it, and I did add a chapter on connecting uh, Zoom to OBS into the Helping Your Church live stream book. But essentially, OBS, vMix, Wirecast, most video production softwares today have something called a virtual camera output. And that virtual camera can output directly into uh, Zoom as your webcam. So you click that button, you click your OBS camera or your vMix camera in, in Zoom, and anything you have in OBS or vMix goes to Zoom. That's video, and that is easy. The audio side is just a little bit more difficult because you need to have two virtual audio cables in most setups. One audio cable going from uh, OBS, all the audio from OBS going into your microphone input into Zoom, and then one audio cable taking the speaker output of Zoom, the audio coming from the far end, into back into OBS. So it's connected that way. I've got a bunch of videos and guides on the Stream Geeks YouTube channel, and uh, we're showing it right now. So Mike, if you cut over to Tess, um, you'll see that Tess is in Zoom right now. She, I can, we can hear her, she can hear us, and she's got a whole you know, team of people there with her. Um, and we could hear and see, they can all see us, we can hear them. Another thing we did, which I'll just, uh, I'll shut up in a second, but we got our Zoom upgraded to 1080p. So Mike, I don't know if you can show Tess full screen, but it's literally full 1080p quality in Zoom. In order to do that, you do need to have, um, a business account, meaning you have to have 10 users or more on your, your Zoom account. And then if you do, you can enable HD, which we have done. So I am kind of interested, Tess, to see what the, uh, the other folks on the Zoom call think. But they, if you check your video statistics, um, we're definitely getting 1280 by 720. We've tested getting 1920 by 1080 as well. Yes, I'm getting a uh, 720 right now. Good. But I, we know as you add more Zoom callers, that can degrade the quality. Yes. 
All right, should I take one from YouTube or Zoom right now? I know there was a question on internet going down and oh. always having to use an iPhone as backup. Is there any way to optimize your internet? Or maybe we could talk about checking your speed or? Here it is here. Our biggest problem is the internet going down. So we always have to use an iPhone as our backup. So, you know, your internet comes from your internet service provider. Your internet service provider gives you a router. That router should technically, and Stephen, tell me what you think about this, but they should be guaranteed, if you're paying for it, they should be guaranteeing you a certain amount of download speed and a certain amount of upload speed. So um, if you're not getting that from your internet service provider, they're, you're not getting what you're paying for. Right, Stephen? Yeah, no, that was something, and I, I feel their pain because we're kind of in a rural area with our church, and we actually went to a business class. And the reason, and, and I'll give you guys a little tip what you can do, especially if you don't have uh, your smaller church and you don't have folks like we don't have people physically in the building, you can tell your service provider, hey, we're only there Sundays and maybe one other day of the week. And they'll give you that residential pricing for a business class internet. And as Paul said, that should have 99.9% .9 reliability as far as your, your, your upload and your download. Like they, it shouldn't be dropping or you shouldn't have internet issues. If you do, you should be calling them. Um, but I'd also get to the root of that problem if you're constantly dropping. I would try a service where you directly connect to your modem and see if it drops. If it's not, then maybe your router needs to be replaced or firmware needs to be updated. You know, break it down. So, Paul, I mean, that's something 100%. You should be getting that as a business class. If you have business class, you should be getting that reliability. Yeah, I mean, going over to the phone is not going to be great quality because mm -mm. your phone's on Wi-Fi. You know, your phone, the, if, if your internet's not working, your Wi-Fi is probably not working. So then you're relying on the phone's cellular connection. Um, at least it keeps people connected. Now, I will say I like Zoom as a backup option because let's say your internet does go down and lots of people are in the Zoom meeting. Well, that's okay. The Zoom meeting is not going to go down because Zoom is hosted in the cloud. So if your internet comes back, the Zoom meeting, you can rejoin the Zoom meeting. So Zoom is a layer of, to this that I find crucial, not only because it gives you the two-way communications, but because it literally won't go down because it's in the cloud. It's not like a live stream that's going up, and if your internet you know, falls, then, it, then it's down. Um, so Zoom is actually a backup in, in a lot of ways uh, to, to a problem with the internet going down. And maybe you want to put Zoom on your iPhone. It's more realistic to be honest to have zoom on your iphone and try to remain communications with the zoom meeting than it is to try to broadcast an hd video stream to youtube with your iphone so harold in zoom wants to know if ptc cameras work with ecam so Ecamm Live uh, will support the ptc optics cameras in a couple different ways um, Ecamm Live's awesome they Ecamm Live has uh, is for Mac only, and they support USB, they support NDI, and they obviously support any type of capture card. So if you wanted to run SDI from a camera, you could convert it from SDI to USB. I do not believe that Ecamm has a PTZ camera control integration. So with that, you can use our free Mac PTZ camera controller. Or maybe, maybe you might want to use like the iOS camera controller, which I can show off, or iOS or Android controller. Um, but Ecamm is a great software, and it's very easy to use, which is why people like it so much. I will throw in a tip for OBS, though. OBS is free. OBS is available for Mac. And OBS does have a uh, plug-in for PTC control. But Ecamm is a little more powerful, I think. On the topic of Ecamm, CRM is asking if there's a benefit of using a software plugin with Ecamm over a serial joystick. So I don't believe that Ecamm has a software plugin for PTZ control. Uh, if they do, please let me know. But I yeah, do that not... would be really interesting. Yeah, if we if they do, I would love to see it. I have never seen a PTZ control plugin for Ecamm. 
Okay, here's one from Mike. Is it possible to set up a network of NDI cameras with vMix and a gigabit switch if you don't have an internet connection or only a poor internet? Or do you have to have internet as well? Oh, Mike, or uh, Stephen, these are going to be some good questions for us because you know what's coming up down the pipeline for us. Yeah, I mean, that's something for my remote setup that I'm going to be doing. I want to run four PTZ Optics cameras via NDI and bringing a router on the road with me uh, to do exactly uh, my, what Mike's saying is connecting it to a router and making it not necessarily go online, but doing some live to tape stuff, um, connecting my super joy to it and being able to control those over the local ne network that I'm creating. And then putting a switch in place that if I do want to stream that I can, but this way I don't have to ask permission, Paul, if let's say I came to headquarters there and wanted to create a stream and wanted to get my own, you know, get access to the network and I can't, I can create my own network and thus make it work. So NDI is dependent on your network. So as long as you're, you know, creating a network, there shouldn't be any reason why you can't do that. Yeah, I'll throw in another tip there too. So if you don't have a router, and I've, I've done this. So if you have a router, your router is basically the brain for the network. And mm -hmm. NDI does like to have a good router, right? Because a good router can be configured to have, you know, there's a lot of different configuration settings on your router, like multicast and other things that can make NDI perform really well. But I have used, um, I have used a, a computer with vMix and four or five NDI cameras with just a network switch, no router no internet and it works the problem is is that without the router you don't have dhcp so you need to have static ip addresses for each camera so that's not a problem right so if you've just got a computer a network switch and four cameras as long as they're all on the same uh local ips even without a router it does work fine with like the dumbest switch possible now and i don't want to go too techy on this but there's something called a managed switch and an unmanaged switch. A managed switch almost has router-like capabilities inside of it. An unmanaged switch, you know, sometimes we call it a dumb switch. And those actually work better a lot of times because there's nothing, you know, to mess up the NDI traffic. Um, so if you just want to get a dumb unmanaged gigabit switch and you have no internet, just throw the cameras on there, that should work fine. Just make sure you need to have them on static IP addresses. There's so many good questions here. Um, okay. On Zoom, Mark is saying that they don't have a huge budget, but they're interested in introducing a tripod and gimbal for a third NDI camera for baptisms during a service. Which NDI camera should we consider? Should we do this via a dedicated uh, WAP, wide area? What is that? Wide area, you, you guys will know what it is. Should we purchase a fluid head mount if we plan a, to pan from a tripod? All right, that was a lot. <laughs> Wireless access point. Wireless access point, yes. You got it. Um, Save myself. Well, you know, I've had some of those same thoughts because, you know, your smartphone can become an NDI camera and it's totally wireless and it looks pretty good over a WAP, a wireless access point. So you can put a phone on a gimbal and you can give it to a volunteer and they can run out and they can capture some great footage. And, you know, smartphones can have a couple hours of battery life, even while they're broadcasting HD video with NDI. Now, older phones, will the, the battery will just tank when it's sending HD video over Wi-Fi. Uh, older phones also don't really, can't really handle some of the newer NDI app uh, upgrades. But yeah, I mean, this is an easy way to add a secondary camera. It's kind of free. You buy a $100 gimbal, you, st you stick a smartphone on there. The app is like 10 bucks, and it, it works pretty good. Um, the benefit of having like an NDI Z cam, uh, I have one here. I don't, it's really not on, not on camera. But um, an NDI powered over Ethernet camera is that it always works. You don't need to charge the battery. You don't need to worry about it. You plug it into your network and you're good for 10 years, right? You can use this thing. The PTZ Optics cameras have a five-year warranty. So there is a benefit to having an installed camera. But if you're, you know, if you're just trying to add a camera, what do you think, Steven? I mean, the, the NDI app on a phone is pretty good. Absolutely. And what we actually use, um, I'm going to kind of cut to this mic. So 
so you can uh, so you guys can see this. Um, I actually have one of these. It's called the Iographer, and it's made for smartphones. And you can add additional lenses onto it, and it works over NDI. Um, and it's very affordable. Uh, you know, you can get them for tripods to put them on there. Um, but like for an iPad or something like that, it's very affordable, 75 bucks, you know, depending if you want all the mic rigs. I know they've got uh, some different things like that. But um, I've used these, Paul, and, and, I, and I love them. I use it uh, pretty regularly even for YouTube videos um, for different things that uh, because the phone cameras are so great anymore, it's great for getting some B-roll. But um, if you're looking for something inexpensive, uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great way to do it now. The downside, every time you get a new phone, because Apple wants to change it all the time, you will have to probably upgrade, depending on if Apple stays with uh, the form factor, which we know that they really don't. That was That's the only downside, but sometimes you can kind of pass it along to a neighboring uh, church or fellow broadcaster that maybe doesn't have the latest and greatest phone, and they can get use out of it, or you can get some of your money back for it. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. I forgot about I Iographer. I had seen that at CES. And uh, look who's joining the show. Mike's in the house. Our producer, Mike, dropping in, <laughs> saying hi. Yeah. So we've only Great got about yes. 10 minutes left because we do need to stop at 2 o'clock. So we Tess, have a giveaway. Oh, my gosh. I, we didn't even talk about this. Someone's going to win a PTZ Optics webcam. So, Tess, why don't you pull a winner? And we'll start okay. um, announcing winners. I will. I'm going to do a couple more. Um, I'm going to do a couple more questions here while we're waiting for that, Stephen. What is your experience, if any, using a video over IP into a Magewell Pro Convert and then going into a switcher, specifically with multiple cameras? Heather, doing some complicated video production over here. I like it. <laughs> um, Magewell is great. I've used their Pro Convert. Um, I generally, now let me back up and what is it? So Magewell has a device that will take an NDI video feed and convert it into HDMI, right? They've also got the opposite device that will take an HDMI feed and convert it into NDI. So either way, right? Take an NDI feed, convert it to HDMI for a hardware switcher or go the opposite way. Uh, most of the time, Heather, when I've been using the Magewell Pro Converts, I take an uh, NDI feed from somewhere, you know, wherever I need it, and I actually just plug an HDMI into a display. And the latency is very low. Um, is it lower than a direct HDMI connection? No, it's probably a little bit more, but it's barely noticeable. So um, if you're trying to do that with multiple cameras, I would say, you know, why are you putting so many eggs in the basket of a video switcher? Maybe you should be using a software switcher on a computer. But I get it. You probably all the eggs in the, in this video switcher <laughs> basket. That was good. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, Michael be here all week with, uh, with 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 puns for everybody. But uh, yeah, so I think it's it's you know it's doable. Um, it it should work. But I wouldn't the because those are expensive devices. I mean, you don't want you don't want to turn a Blackmagic A10 Mini into an NDI video switcher and buy four. Pro converts, you know, just buy yourself a nice computer and put vMix on it, right? Or OBS. Um, but I can see, you know, there's all types of different workflows, so that it, it definitely it, it should work. So far, I've uh, got Bradley White or Steve Porter. I'm all right. continuing. Bradley White or Steve Porter. Here's Heather. Heather Heather's jumping in again. She says she has six PTZ Optics cameras, and she's in the process of setting them up. They're SDI, not NDI. And she's holding out for Dante AV. So I'm guessing she's trying to convert some of her SDI cameras into NDI with the Pro Convert. I see. Well, couldn't you just simply hook them up with a, a cheaper capture card and use NDI Connect from New Tech and just put that on a PC? And then you'll get the four inputs. Uh, if you, Well, there's two that are free if you get the NDI uh, Connect app, which I... I actually uh, do that with a few of my cameras that are not NDI supported. I run them SDI into a capture card, open it up on my PC on the free version so I can get two cameras, which converts it to NDI, and I send it to the TriCaster or vMix or Wirecast, and it gives me the ability to use them as NDI cameras. So I think the NDI Connect, Paul, I want to yeah. say it's up near $1,000 for the software, but then you get four inputs as long as you have well, a, a, OB a way to get OBS. 
OBS can convert an unlimited amount of NDI cameras into oh or SDI there you go. cameras into NDI for free. A lot of people don't know that the OBS okay. um, the OBS plugin or for the NDI plugin for OBS uh, it, it works a lot better on Windows than it does on Mac. But um, there's a filter that you can add to any input, and that filter basically makes it an NDI output. Most people just use OBS with NDI just to get an output out of OBS. But you can actually add an NDI output filter. It's the filter option in OBS to make any um, video capture device NDI output of OBS. Well, that's good because so. I think vMix, you're limited to four, I think, four on the output. And I think Wirecast, you're limited as well. So that's good. No, I think you, with, with vMix, you can do, a, you can, you, there's, a, there's a checkbox to make all cameras NDI. Okay, I'll have to check it. I'm still getting up to speed on that. But you're, I, you're still, I have I, mine I've, set up for certain things, yeah. Are you telling me that you're, you're starting to become a vMix user, Steven? I'm, I'm, I, listen, I know enough about vMix right now to be dangerous and run a show, so um, I haven't gotten into the nitty nitty gritty of it. But that's that's interesting workflow because then you don't necessarily need that uh, NDI connect. Well, really Heather doesn't here, doesn't guys. trust computers to do what hard, hardware is meant for. So Heather Heather's a little oh, old well. school, so I, I can't can't blame her. No, nope. can't blame her. Um, I still like my SDI connections. I, I'm with her. Yeah, trust me, we're running all SDI here too. Okay, we've got some NDI stuff going, <laughs> but it's mainly SDI. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left. We have a winner, right, Stat? Right, Tess? Yes, Bradley White was here. And claimed Good job, Bradley. First. We'll be shipping you yes. a PTZ Optics webcam. Congratulations! Hit that like button, guys, if you're excited about the Easter service. We didn't get anybody hitting the dislike button. So they didn't want nobody, to be mean to us. You know, it's okay. If you're worried about <laughs> streaming Easter services, hit the down button. I want to see. But I Paul think, has uh, the old mentality. Any press is good press. Any engagement <laughs> is good engagement. Well, it's because you told them to do it, so they're not going to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> is there any last questions that we have about five minutes? I apologize that we have to go at two o'clock. There um, is a million questions. I will keep them coming. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Setzer uses OBS and a PTZ Optics camera with sound from our mixer to simultaneously live stream to Facebook and use the OBS virtual camera for a Zoom meeting. Okay. Great. This is good. He's asking about audio delay. Okay. Um, but the OBS virtual camera for Zoom for Zoom doesn't seem to observe the audio delay that he's syncing. And, yes. and we've also gotten questions on latency as well with us using Zoom and then different streaming destinations. Okay. So, so it's all in one. That's a good, I'll try to answer that one. So, so Zoom is pretty much real time, which is awesome because real time communications, right? We need to communicate with people who aren't physically present, um, which is also kind of incredible how Zoom is 1080p. Um, so Zoom's getting a lot better. Um, but... Essentially, when you're streaming to YouTube, that's RTMP, and there's a significant amount of latency there. Um, and what YouTube does is they buffer. And so you can get 30 to 60 seconds of latency on the YouTube. Just don't worry about the YouTube. It's 30 seconds behind. Who cares? Zoom is real time. When you output your virtual camera from OBS to Zoom, it should be pretty much real time, very low latency. So you should be able to do real-time communications just like I'm speaking to Tess right now. We have no problem hearing each other and communicating. There's no, there's no latency. You know, there's a minimal amount of latency. I think it's like 60 milliseconds, but it's not enough to be a problem. Just don't, basically just don't worry about syncing the video between YouTube and Facebook and all those other live streaming destinations because they are going to have latency but the amazing thing is they can scale, right? You can have thousands and thousands of people watching the live stream. It can go out on social media. There's so much great stuff that it can do, but it can't do the real-time communication that Zoom can do. So use Zoom for what it's good for. And uh, yeah, it's almost like church and state. Like when you're thinking about like you're in your mind, you've got like, you've got the real-time communication stuff that has to be perfect. And then you've got the push, right? The RTMP push. It's going out to YouTube and Facebook and just let that go. It's going to be 30 seconds. It's going to be 60 seconds behind. That's okay. 
Um, we've got a couple questions about if this will be available on demand. It will on Facebook and YouTube at PTZ Optics if you want to uh, rewatch any of this. And um, okay, let's see here. More comments, more comments, getting back to the questions. What is your experience, if any, been with setting up video over IP into a major well pro convert convert? So oh, we did that one, Tess. We did, we oh, we did, did that, that one. one? Yeah, we did that one okay. while you were doing the giveaway. Okay. All right. Do we have an email for online stuff? I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but we certainly do have email. You can email us at marketing at ptzoptics.com. Um, okay. We have over 50,000 on our Easter stream at Christ Fellowship in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Congratulations, that's awesome. We did have one person to do the dislike button. So somebody out there is still worried about streaming their Easter services. So I just wanna say, I don't think I mentioned this, but we will ship you the Helping Your Church live stream book for free. So there was a QR code at some point just search Helping Your Church live stream book. We will ship this to you for free all the way up to Easter. So I guess that's pretty much all we have. Steven, do you have any final tips for everybody? Just get in there and do it. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to prepare everything. You're going to wear yourself, you know, sick in some cases. Um, you're just, there's always going to be something that's going to pop up. You can only control what you have control over. So do your best, do your due diligence, but uh, prepare for that unexpected thing. It, it It's bound to happen. And that's, that's the reality, Paul. Alicia is saying she's having trouble setting up her super joy. So Alicia, call our support team. That's what they're there for. Uh, there's that. You can go to help.ptzoptics.com to submit a ticket, but literally just pick, we pick up the phone. So just, just pick up the phone and call us. They will walk you through it. And I believe they're pretty patient. So it'll be okay. One last question, Paul, I think you can knock out really quick. What's the latency okay. difference between IP and SDI on our camera? Or yes, NDI and SDI on our cameras. It should be about the same. Uh, Steven and I are preparing for to do some tests with uh, NDI because there's some updates coming for NDI that are making it even faster than SDI. So barely supposedly faster than SDI, Stephen. So we'll have to put that to the test soon and see. I'm I'm curious to see that and the compression to the video. If we can see a difference with the compression versus true uncompressed SDI. And, and the the engineers have a lot to say about that. I was told that you know they can compress it, but then they can decode it. And when they decode it, um, this is something I was just learning. With some of the newer technology, you compress something, you send it, but then they decode it when it's un and it gets uncompressed. So um, that has to do with some other things like SRT and video over the internet. Um, but let's let's save that for our next show. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. See you next time. Bye. Yeah. Bye.